Okay, so now let's move on into lipid and protein metabolism. Previously, we were looking at glycolysis and mitochondrial reactions from the standpoint of carbohydrate oxidation. These pathways also serve for oxidation of proteins and lipids as backup fuels if it's necessary. Lipids and proteins will enter at varying levels throughout this series of reactions. So first of all, let's look at lipids. Lipids are triglycerides, composed of a glycerol and three fatty acids. And they're stored in the body's fat cells, or adipocytes. Each adipocyte has a given supply of triglycerides. And those triglycerides will sort of recycle or turn over every two to three weeks. They can be released into the blood, and they'll either be oxidized, burned, and used as fuel, or they can be redeposited in other fat cells. So the process of synthesizing fat from other types of molecules is called lipogenesis. We'll see that amino acids and sugars can be used to make fatty acids and glycerol. The key molecule here was PGAL because it can be so easily converted into glycerol. PGAL was phosphoglyceraldehyde or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, both the same molecule. So basically, we can take this molecule, PGAL, and we can convert it into glycerol. It's a three carbon molecule. And that glycerol can then be put together with fatty acids to form new triglycerides. Now, acetyl-CoA is a two-carbon compound, and many acetyl-CoAs, if they can't go on through the cycle of citric acid cycle, they'll be converted into chains of fatty acids, two carbons at a time. The opposite of that is lipolysis, which is breaking down of fat so that we can use it as fuel. So we'll take a triglyceride and break the glycerol and three fatty acids apart. This is stimulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine, glucocorticoids, thyroid hormone, and growth hormone, all the processes that might require extra fuel. So you can see here, again, glycerol that's been stored as triglycerides can be formed into PGAL, a three carbon molecule and it can enter the pathway of glycolysis and continue down on into the citric acid cycle and produce lots of ATP. Now, PGAL is only a three carbon molecule, so relative to glucose, it's only going to produce half as much ATP because glucose was a six carbon molecule, remember, and it resulted in two PGALs and thus two pyruvic acids and two acetyl-CoAs. The rest of a triglyceride is in the form of fatty acids, and fatty acids will undergo beta oxidation. Beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondrial matrix and breaks down the fatty acids two carbon atoms at a time, thus forming the perfect intermediate to move into the citric acid cycle. So fatty acids are very energy rich. A fatty acid, let's say with 16 carbons, can yield 129 molecules of ATP, so it's a much richer source of energy than a glucose molecule, which is precisely why fat can have 9 calories per gram rather than just 4 that we see in carbohydrates. If there's an excess of acetyl groups, those can be metabolized by the liver in a process called ketogenesis. So fatty acids are catabolized into two carbon acetyl groups by the process of beta oxidation. And these would usually enter the citric acid cycle as acetyl-CoA. However, in the liver, if there's excess acetyl-CoA, it would undergo ketogenesis, which is where it's metabolized by the liver and it forms these groups called ketone bodies, acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, and acetone. These are the ketone bodies. Some cells, however, can convert acetoacetic acid back to acetyl-CoA and thus 
feed these C2 fragments into the citric acid cycle to extract their energy. But when the body's rapidly oxidizing fats, excess ketone bodies will accumulate. This causes ketoacidosis that's typical of type 1 diabetes mellitus in which the cells must oxidize fats because they can't absorb glucose. So the big issue here is that acetyl-CoA cannot go backwards up the glycolytic pathway in order to produce glucose. It's an irreversible pathway once you get to the point of pyruvic acid. So the glycerol can be used for gluconeogenesis because it comes in as PGAL into the glycolytic pathways, but the fatty acids cannot. Now, earlier on, we mentioned that fats cannot be completely oxidized when there's not enough carbohydrate in the diet. So remember oxaloacetate, the workbench from the citric acid cycle? Well, when there's not enough carbohydrate in the diet, oxaloacetate will be converted into glucose and used itself as energy, and thus it's unavailable for the citric acid cycle. So at that point, fat oxidation produces excess ketones, which leads to elevated blood ketones, known as ketosis, and pH imbalances, known as ketoacidosis. And ketosis is a very serious risk of extremely low carbohydrate diets. So take a moment here to pause the recording and diagram the utilization of lipids in the process of cellular respiration. So consider how these stored triglycerides get broken down into glycerol and free fatty acids. The fatty acids are oxidized in two acetyl groups and where each of them enters the process of glycolysis and mitochondrial reactions. And then we'll continue on with looking at protein metabolism. So now on to proteins. About 100 grams of tissue a day is broken down into free amino acids, which are combined with the amino acids that we take in from our diet to form the amino acid pool. All the amino acids in this pool are the ones that we use to synthesize our own proteins. All of the amino acids that we have in this pool are absorbed by the small intestine. 50% of them come from our diet. 25% of them, though, come from dead epithelial cells. So the intestinal mucosa is where we see the fastest rate of cell division. And we'll see these epithelial cells sloughed off and digested themselves. And that gives us this 25%. And then we also have enzymes that become tired, and thus they get digested by other enzymes. So that contributes the other 25%. From this amino acid pool, we can either use the amino acids to form other proteins, or we can convert them into other intermediates, like glucose and fat, which then can be used as fuel. These conversions involve three processes. Deamination, which means removal of an amino group, the NH2. Amination, adding an amino group. Or transamination, moving an amino group from one molecule to another. If amino acids are going to be used as a fuel, first they need to be deaminated. That means we need to remove the NH2 group, the amino group. What remains from this is a keto acid. Keto acids can either be converted to pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA, or one of the other acids of the citric acid cycle. Now, it's interesting to note that some of these processes are reversible, so that during a shortage of amino acid, the citric acid cycle intermediates can be aminated and converted into amino acids. In gluconeogenesis, for example, the keto acids are then going to be used to synthesize glucose. So some amino acids enter the citric acid cycle via alpha-ketoglutaric acid, 
When an amino acid is deaminated, the amino acid is transferred to the citric acid cycle via alpha-ketoglutaric acid. It's then converted to glutamic acid. And glutamic acid can travel from any of the body's cells to the liver where its amino group is removed and it's converted back to alpha-ketoglutaric acid. The NH2 is going to become ammonia, which is toxic and, of course, cannot accumulate. And so that's where the urea cycle will take the ammonia and combine it with carbon dioxide to produce a less toxic waste urea, which eventually will be excreted by the kidneys as nitrogenous wastes. But the glutamic acid is converted into alpha-ketoglutaric acid, and that then can enter the citric acid cycle. So protein synthesis, well, it's a complex process. We've highlighted that definitely in general biology and back in chapter four. It involves taking the code from the DNA, converting it into a messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and finds a ribosome where it'll call in for different transfer RNAs and bring in amino acids to form a protein. This process is stimulated by growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and insulin. And of course, it requires an ample supply of all amino acids. Most of these can be made by the liver or from other amino acids or citric acid cycle intermediates through transamination reactions. Some amino acids, remember, are essential, and thus they must be obtained from the diet. Now, it's surprising that the liver has so many roles in carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism. However, the majority of its functions aren't even digestive. And these hepatocytes that we learned about a couple of chapters ago perform all of these functions. The only thing they don't do is phagocytosis. So it's Understandable then that degenerative liver diseases such as hepatitis or cirrhosis of the liver and cancers are especially life-threatening considering how huge of a role the liver has. So take a moment now to diagram how and where proteins enter the process of cellular respiration. This is all kind of becoming one big diagram, and that's just the point. This will be the diagramming assignment for the week. So now we've finished with a section on lipid and protein metabolism. You're ready to move on to the metabolic states and metabolic rate section. See you soon.